Thank you guys so much for, uh, for joining us. You know, I just want to first uh, start out and uh, thank Oklahomans, uh, our health care providers. I went and took a tour of one of our hospitals yesterday and met the doctors and nurses that are on the front lines, and they are doing a fantastic job. So thank you to them and our first responders. Also, our business community. Uh, we're doing a great job of innovative. Oklahomans are taking this seriously. Uh, the recommendations from the CDC, um, I'm hearing from all over the state. We are keeping gatherings below uh, 10 or more. So thank you for uh, everything that you're doing. Today we're, we're here and I wanted to announce um, on Friday we launched the Governor's Solutions Task Force. Uh, this group is made up of experts in their fields and is designed to help us with the comprehensive response to COVID-19. Uh, we've created a dashboard with data points that we're gathering on a daily basis. This is up 24-7 now. Um, we are gathering P, P, and E uh, from all the different hospitals. So we know exactly what hospitals, uh, their, their lead times they need, and exactly how much uh, uh, P, P, and E they have uh, in their stock. Uh, we are collecting ICU uh, bed counts. We've got the hospitals with their surge numbers. Uh, we have uh, ventilator uh, numbers, and we're tracking this on a daily basis. The state epidemiologist is modeling several different uh, scenarios for our state as we're preparing for uh, uh, surges in our hospital use and also uh, all of the uh, available equipment that we're going to need. Uh, he'll be, uh, we'll be talking about that a little bit later on. I have four uh, goals for Oklahoma. Uh, my first and number one priority is to protect the health and lives of Oklahomans. Number two is to mitigate the impact to Oklahoma's economy. And number three is to position the state to fully recover from this crisis as quickly as possible. Number four is to continue our desire to achieve Oklahoma's full potential to be a top 10 state. Yesterday, I signed an executive order that did three things. Number one, it allowed Oklahoma State University and Oklahoma University's research departments to set up lab testing. Uh, number two, it allowed us to cut red tape to reissue licenses uh, to get nurses quickly uh, back on the job. Number three, um, we restricted two drugs that were mentioned as possible treatments uh, to keep folks from hoarding them. And let me be clear, there are certain chronic illnesses that people need this, like lupus. They will, this is the reason we, we uh, signed this executive order uh, to make sure that, those, uh, uh, that they have had availability for that drug. This week, we will have four mobile testing sites up and running around our state. Uh, we will have donation sites up and running for PPE to be donated from our manufacturing facilities, uh, from our different citizens. Unemploy unemployment claims we're tracking very, very closely. We have seen a huge spike in unemployment claims, almost double what we saw last week every single day. And my heart is breaking for the Oklahomans who are struggling, who have lost their jobs, due to no fault of their own through this crisis. So we have waived the waiting period uh, to get unemployment benefits. We have pushed back the tax filing deadlines to match the federal IRS guidelines. Small businesses all across our state are struggling. So we can announce today that uh, the Small Business Association, you have the ability to apply uh, for uh, low interest loans and also help. <clears throat> the rumor that we have uh, activated the National Guard to shut down the borders is simply not true, and I'm going to let uh, General Thompson address that a little bit in a second. Um, but I know that, that Oklahomans are fearful and anxious uh, in this uncertain times. We're all dealing with 
a little bit of anxiety. And I just want you to know we are going to get through this. We're going to get through this together. And I just want to encourage Oklahomans to continue to follow the CDC guidelines, uh, the social distancing, uh, the innovation that businesses are doing all across our state. They're doing a really good job. Uh, churches are mobilizing, church online. Uh, businesses are continuing to uh, think of innovative ways to continue to serve their customers while we're still respecting the CDC guidelines. So thank you for that. Continue to innovate, continue to do that. Uh, let me turn it over to uh, General Thompson for a couple comments. Well, good evening, everyone. And thank you, Governor, for allowing me to be a part of the panel and talk about some current events. It appears to be a lot of uh, interest related to the Guard and the role that the Guard will play um, as this um, uh, pandemic plays out. And I just want to assure the, the people of Oklahoma that the, the purpose of the Guard, the reason the Guard exists, is to deploy and to help Oklahoma in this time of need. If you allow me just for a moment, in, in just in my lifetime, in 1973, we had a huge uh, prison outbreak in McAllister. The Guard was called out to stand beside correctional officers and Oklahoma State troopers. In 1999, uh, we had the May 3rd tornado. In 1995, we had the Murrow bombing building, which shocked not only America, but our country as a whole. In 2005, the Oklahoma National Guard flew over northwestern Oklahoma and dropped hay bales for farmers who are afraid their livestock would uh, starve to death without some help. In 2015, we did the same thing. In 2013, we had the May 3rd tornado or the May 20th tornado in Moore, Oklahoma, which horribly, uh, horrifically uh, hit an elementary school, and it, it was heartbreaking. The Guard was there to safeguard that community and serve that community. Less than a year ago in 2019, the Oklahoma National Guard had up to 500 members on active duty to help the community of Tulsa, Fort Gibson, um, Sand Springs to fill sandbags and to walk on levees 24 hours a day to watch the levees to make sure they didn't break and endanger the communities that lived in the vicinity of, of those levees. And so I can go on, uh, but I won't. My modest point for re mentioning all of that is there are two things in common when the Guard deploys. Number one, they deploy when Oklahoma needs us. And number two, from everything from a prison riot to dropping hay out of the back of a helicopter, we are never in charge. We are always there to support the governor or that community in need. And that will be no different here. If the Guard is called out, the Guard is called out to help Oklahomans in their time of need. And I'll yield my time to Secretary Loffridge. Thank you, General. We are indeed taking action, and among those actions, in addition uh, to the four satellite locations for testing that the governor alluded to, we will also this week uh, be standing up a new platform in partnership with Google uh, that will facilitate um, the screening for all Oklahomans. Details on that will be available this week. Um, additionally, we, have, we all know and have been advised uh, that COVID-19 hits most severely those individuals over 60 years of age. But our data here in Oklahoma indicates that most of our positive cases are in the 18 to 49 year old cohort. What that means is that our actions, each of our actions, impact folks in each age range. And therefore, uh, our call is for that of personal responsibility. Um, social distancing works. It is our single most effective means of muting transport of this uh, virus. And so we continue to encourage Oklahomans uh, to exercise social distancing uh, alongside personal hygiene. We need everyone to focus on these measures uh, to make sure that we're safe, because if we're not safe, uh, no one is, including our health care workers, which Dr. Schrummer will allude to in just a moment. If you must go out in the community, either for work or for essential services, be mindful and aware of your risk and your role in helping stop the spread of the disease. We reiterate our crucial recommendation not to visit nursing homes, retirement centers, or long-term care facilities, as these pop populations are particularly vulnerable, and they rely on us to protect them. At this point, I'd like to introduce uh, my colleague, uh, Casey Shrum, uh, both Secretary of Science and Innovation uh, and President of Oklahoma State University's Center for Health Sciences. Thank you, Secretary Lothridge. 
and good evening. First, to our healthcare workers, our physicians, our nurses, paramedics, and all of those on the front lines, thank you. We greatly appreciate your service during this unprecedented pandemic. We're working hard to address the needs of our frontline workers so that they can do what they do best, and that is take excellent care of Oklahomans. In order for our, us to have an appropriate response to the COVID-19 pandemic, we must have the capacity to, to test additional populations. In addition to having adequate protective equipment for our frontline healthcare workers and having hospital beds and ventilators for those who might need them. Through the governor's ex executive order, we should be able to expand our testing capabilities within the state by utilizing both OU and OSU's research laboratories for testing by the end of the week. If our labs are running at maximum capacity, we will be able to test an additional 10,000 Oklahomans. At OSU, we can run up to 2,000 tests per day and have results within 24 hours. That means we should be able to expand our testing capability by tenfold by the end of the week. Thank you, Dr. Trump. Uh, we'll open it up to a few questions. Uh, at this time, no. We're, we're following CDC guidelines, and that is to uh, stop groups of over 10 or more. And the social distancing that uh, Jerome talked about, um, that's what the CDC guidelines are. That's what I'm going to continue to preach. And, um, um, you know, the, 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 question, the question is, if you, when, you, when you shut down uh, something, when does it come back? We're looking at modeling. Um, that this could be, this could go on for a while. We, this may be the new normal, and that's why I'm telling businesses they've got to innovate. We've got to think about how do we deliver services, how do we go to the grocery store. That's why I'm so proud of, I've been having conversations with all the grocery store association, the restaurant association. Uh, they're now opening up an hour early for our elderly population, right after a deep cleaning of their, of their facilities. And so we've just got to be innovative. And we're hearing that all over from the different business communities, and, and uh, that's my message to them. What's the, the line between social responsibility and, and the role of the government to say, hey, we, we need to not do this here in Oklahoma City and Norman, Tulsa? Executives there have said, we need to close down these certain facilities. At what point does it get to where you have to make that call? I mean, does that well, make sense? Absolutely, but uh, you know we're we're following the CDC guidelines, and let's be let's be clear that our fact pattern is different in our state than it is in New York City or it is in Los Angeles or Chicago, and and we're hearing this stuff on the news and and sometimes reacting to it. Um, we have the epidemiologists who are focused on telling us when our surge will be. Uh, we're modeling those factors. There may be a time that we have to do other things. Uh, that time is not right now. And, um, and again, the CDC guidelines are a recommendation to have uh, groups of, not, not more than groups of 10 or more. And from what I'm seeing, the churches and the businesses are, are doing that on their own and, uh, and being very responsible. And so that's why I'm so proud and that's why I want to keep reiterating that to the business community, to be innovative, keep following the guidelines of the CDC, and uh, that's our recommendation at this time. It sounds like you're saying that there could be a time when that has happened, and it sounds like you're saying that if the state's epidemiologists were to come to you and say, hey, we're starting to see more community spread in some of these places, Woodward, Guyman, wherever it would be, that don't have currently confirmed cases. If the state's epidemiologists came to you and said, Governor, it's our recommendation that we, we have all these restaurants and bars closed down theaters, is that when you would do that? You know, it's, it's a possibility. I mean, everything's on the table as we're, we're in uncharted territory. This is changing so rapidly as the CDC gives more recommendations to us. Uh, so we'll take that as it comes, but we have uh, 66 cases right now in the, in the state of Oklahoma. Uh, we're monitoring that really, really closely. Um, 
what we're focused on is taking those taking those uh, modeling numbers and then forecasting and making sure that we're prepared for hospital, for ventilators, for the PP&E, for all the different, uh, uh, for the hospitals. And so uh, we'll, we'll take that as it comes. This is early, early on um, in, in this cycle. And, and uh, uh, again, I, that's my, my message right now to Oklahomans is continue to be innovative, continue to follow the CDC guidelines, um, and, and, and we, we can get through this. We're going to take some questions from the uh, conference call. If you could just repeat the questions so the viewers at home could hear as you answer them. Uh, let's go to Erica. Erica from KWTV, do you have a question? Erica, go ahead. You should be open. All right, we'll work on that. Uh, Benny, you some? Yeah, um, and this may be a question for Secretary Lurich. You had mentioned that here in Oklahoma we're seeing some of the more severe cases in that 18 to 49 mil range. Is there any theory for that or, or that you can pinpoint? I'll defer to our uh, state epidemiologist uh, as to uh, any particulars there, but just to stipulate, um, we are seeing incidents increased in that. Our majority of incidents is 18 to 49, not severity. Um, those, are, uh, those are important distinctions uh, to bear. Um, but I don't think we know enough yet uh, to, uh, you know, to postulate around that. But, uh, but that goes to the governor's point that the data that we see that derives specifically within our borders differs even from that which we've seen in New York, California, and elsewhere. So, so I, would, I, I would add to that that what we are seeing a higher incidence in that area, but then the more we have not changed the high risk, which is those over the age of 65, those that are immunocompromised, those who have chronic conditions. So while we are seeing more patients in that age range, the higher risk population is still the same. Dr. Strong, if the, if the, if the state epidemiologist came to you and said, hey, I think we need to take some more measures to shut down restaurants and bars and theaters across the state. What would be your recommendation to Governor State? Yeah, so I think that we have to remember that where we are right now, uh, you know, we, we, we're all talking about um, flattening the curve, right? And everybody's familiar with that term. Um, we are right now in the mitigation phase. And so what we have to remember right now is that what, what predicts our curves is what we do today in following the CDC guidelines and and, and staying at home, our social distancing. And as we watch those, what we've been working on over um, time is saying, what are the triggers that will be put into place? And we have to watch those and those indications. And as we move out of uh, the mitigation phase and we're monitoring our cases and our testing increases, there may be a time when we make that recommendation to the governor. Did you give an update on some of the data that we have in terms of Sure, we have uh, really two uh, distinct issues. I'll speak to uh, that, which has uh, gained a great deal of currency recently, which is PPE. That's personal protective equipment. Uh, this is vital for the health of our healthcare workers. Uh, as Dr. Shrum has alluded to, that is of preeminent importance. It's front of mind to us, uh, those frontline workers and their protection as they care for those who are ill in our institutions. As we stand right now, we track this daily uh, in seven to eight major categories. Uh, in an aggregate number, we have roughly 9.3 days of PPE on hand. Um, there is a supply chain that has worked both from the state side and from uh, individual institutions that feeds into that. Uh, we are also monitoring each of those pieces along the way. Uh, but as we stand currently, uh, 9.3 uh, days worth of PPE on hand. Uh, I'll defer to Dr. Shrum relative to uh, testing and the like. So as I said before, testing is important. Um, our highest priority will be healthcare workers, those that are hospitalized. And the reason for that is as, as we have patients that are, um, have pending labs, it takes longer for us to know do we need to be utilizing protective equipment. So we want to be very efficient in our use of, of, of protective equipment. We also want to know if our healthcare workers are exposed. Uh, quickly, we don't, we don't want to have to quarantine them for 14 days. Uh, so, and then as we move into expanding our testing capabilities, those that are at the high risk population, then next would be um, targeted for testing. But those two things really go hand in hand. Um, having adequate testing to be able to know what patients 
uh, we need to be utilizing the protective uh, equipment on is key in, in efficiently utilizing the protective gear that we have. Uh, you should know that, you know, this is a, a phenomenon that nationally everyone's experiencing. And so in Oklahoma, we're, we're looking at what we can do to ensure, again, ensure that our healthcare workers frontline, their safety is, is a priority um, so that we can keep them um, working and, and taking care of Oklahomans. Can you talk about the, the preparations for rural hospitals? And there were some questions coming in from our reporters about uh, how are you preparing in rural areas with less access to care and maybe fewer items like ventilators? Sure. Yeah, you can go ahead. Yeah. Sure. Um, a, a brief comment, and then uh, again to Dr. Shrum, but uh, we are in close coordination uh, with all of our health care providers uh, to include the hospitals. Um, focus has certainly landed on Oklahoma City and Tulsa, but we are in daily conversation as well uh, with our rural health care providers. Uh, they've been exceptional with respect. Uh, both to join the effort around PPE, uh, but also in their own preparation. Each of these institutions has their own emergency contingency plans. They are all well down the path uh, of preparation and making those happen at an appropriate time. So I would say our rural hospitals, which comprise uh, a great number of, uh, of our institutions in this state, uh, stand on a very good footing. Um, I support what Secretary Lothridge says. We, we are in communication. Um, with our rural, our, our rural uh, hospitals. Um, they're, they're putting in their information into our system to be monitored as well. And we are tracking um, our, our incidence of, of um, positive results um, on a map so we can see what's happening by county. And we, we know which hospitals are in those counties and we can look at, at what um, equipment they have and what protective gear they, they need as well. You know, there have been a lot of rumors going around about the National Guard at the Tulsa Fairgrounds, the National Guard is here and there. Could you just speak to the scope of the National Guard operation right now in, in, in terms of this task force? Sure. Um, and, and I'm glad you mentioned that because I got a call today about the National Guard being at the Tulsa Fairgrounds. Um, the number of uh, folks that we have, members of the National Guard that we have mo uh, mobilized or activated for this emergency is 19. Uh, 17 uh, Army National Guard and two from the Air Guard. Um, and I, I just want to reassure our, our viewers or the people that live here in Oklahoma, uh, when the Guard comes out, it's not like it's some nameless, faceless bureaucracy. It is your neighbors. It's the people that you go to church with. It's the people that you go and watch softball games with. It's your sons and your daughters. It's people that live in Oklahoma who are coming out to help Oklahoma. So the whole concept of that some bureaucracy is going to roll into Oklahoma to take over Oklahoma is just not based in reality. And I'm glad that you uh, asked that question. Um, Governor, is there any talk or whoever would be the best person to talk about this, uh, the idea that there are surgery centers, there are other places that may have uh, PPE that are using those uh, that may have chosen to stay open. Uh, there, does there come a point where you either uh, call on the phone and ask nicely, or you take out your executive order pen and order them to hand over that uh, personal protective equipment such that the 9.3 days can be expanded? Yeah, I think there's uh, there's certainly a point where we would we would uh, either by executive order or recommendation limit elective surgeries. Uh, first, you have to make those decisions based on what is our supply of PPE. What is the epidemiologist explaining, telling us that we're going to have the spike, how much we're going to need? Uh, so we, there's some data to, to gather before you, you make that decision, but that's certainly something that we've discussed. There are certain hospitals that have already limited elective surgeries. Um, so it's something, that's, uh, it, it's something that our team is considering and we're watching very closely. We have to get our arms around the data. Again, uh, we, we, we're going to make our decisions based on the data uh, that's in Oklahoma on, on what's best for our state. Uh, Governor, you mentioned uh, four mobile testing sites in mm -hmm. online this week. Does anybody have any details on where those will be located and what that would look like here? Yeah, so uh, the four mobile testing sites, I think one's going to be in Kay County uh, around Ponca City, one's in Tulsa, one's in Oklahoma City, and then I believe the fourth one will be in McAllister. Do you, uh, can, can we get a little clarity on who's in charge of the uh, strategic Medical reserve, I guess, is what it was referred to the other day. The the PPE that 
you know, the state had. I've heard some talk that maybe the U.S. Public Health Service folks have, you know, in their region, Oklahoma's in one of several states in the region for the U.S. PHS. Uh, but does the state also have its its own PPE stockpile? And then can you speak to uh, how much of that is, is actually usable? I know that in other states there have been situations where the elastic had fallen apart on masks. Yeah, and I'll let them jump in as well. But uh, so our state does have a uh, strategic supply, and it's owned by the Department of Health. Uh, the federal government also has a, a strategic supply that they will deliver to the states pro rata. Uh, we've been in touch with our federal delegation as we've got our first shipment in uh, to uh, help with our overall supply. Uh, it's in Oklahoma City. It's at a warehouse. Uh, it's under Dr. Schramm. She's in charge of making sure she gathers uh, the need from the hospital. So we're setting up a process uh, to where hospitals can let us know when they're critical. And so she's uh, done a great job. Uh, we, we put together a green, yellow, and red on, on, and then we've tiered the hospitals and their need based on their ICUs, based on who they're seeing on, on uh, uh, positive patients. Let me turn it over to Casey before I mess it up more. <laughs> That was a very good description. Um, yeah, so so what we have been looking at is, you know, how, how do we go about deploying PPE? Um, we we want to make sure that we're getting the resources to the right place. We want to make sure we're monitoring that. So we have set up a database, again, that um, looks like a map. It has all of the hospitals uh, in the state that are in, um, in that database. And each of the hospitals, based off criteria, you know, COVID-19 positive cases, nursing homes, how we have uh, identified which hospitals need that the most, those hospitals would be uh, placed in a tier one. And those hospitals uh, we want to keep on green, which means if a, if a hospital that is a tier one falls into the yellow range, we will be notified, and then that hospital uh, we want to make sure that that, at this point, we want to make sure that that hospital has at least seven days of PPE on hand. And if, they, if they're if they a level two, it will activate at different times based on where they are. And so that's a system that we have put in place to monitor the state. Uh, it, it, in addition, again, that same um, screen when you're looking at it is a map of the state that lights up. Uh, positive for, for counties that have had cases. So it gives us a real-time look at what's going on. Um, it gives us the opportunity to reach out to those hospitals uh, if we need to, to, to further understand what their need is. I have a question. I, I'm sorry, real quick, Charlie. About the, is any of the state's strategic supply, is that, is that still usable? Are there repairs underway on some of the masks that may have deteriorated over time? Sure, we're bringing all those into bear, and I'll, I'll um, yes, as a short answer, I'd also highlight something that Oklahomans are doing increasingly. Uh, when the governor and I were at uh, Integris yesterday, um, they were receiving word that folks were uh, um, distributing patterns, uh, those who are capable of and inclined to sew patterns for exterior surgical masks, not the N95 masks that's the, the, pri uh, the primary uh, healthcare worker mask, but those surgical masks, ear loop, uh, that can cover over those and extend the life of those N95s. Uh, Oklahoma residents are stepping up, and those who are capable and have shown an interest are actually sewing those uh, to spec and then providing them into the medical community. That is an innovation of the type that we think that Oklahomans are uniquely able to make, and we're proud that we see things like that happening already. Okay. Uh, Governor, just uh, Dylan from KOC, I want to know what's your message to Oklahomans who see 67 cases and I think that doesn't sound like a lot, but do the experts have an opinion on how many the actual number might be? Maybe Secretary, you can talk about that. Listen, we, we are going to take this very, very seriously. We're going to follow the CDC's guidelines. Uh, we are looking at modeling, and, and we'll share that with, with Oklahomans. Uh, we've got to continue to practice social distancing. Uh, this is something that uh, uh, we're seeing affect other other countries, and uh, we're we're watching what uh, the fact pattern is in our state, and yes, we have 67, but we also were a little bit behind our first case for some other states. So we have to be uh, proactive and, and look at that surge, and that's really, uh, that's really what this whole task force and this, our solutions task force is focused on. Um, I, would, I would add to that that, you know, as we increase our testing, we know we're going to increase our positives. 
Um, it's important for us to be testing so we know what is going on. Currently, uh, we have 67 um, positive test results, um, and, and, you know, we have tested probably uh, just over 700 uh, individuals with, with test results back. Um, so, so that tells us when we test, you know, we have the capability to test 10,000 more Oklahomans, we're obviously going to see, you know, those, those rates increase. But again, I think we have to go back to remind um, Oklahomans that uh, we are in that mitigation phase right now and social distancing, staying at home, washing our hands, all those things that the CDC guidelines are saying to us sound very simple, but they're so important right now because we want to limit the spread. And, and so that is, that is our way of flattening the curve. And when we flatten the curve, it allows our healthcare system to take the capacity of, of those new cases and, over a period of time. And that's what we're really wanting to do right now. And I, I want to underscore one thing that, uh, that Jerome talked about. Uh, Oklahomans are stepping up. And I, this, is a, this is a request for manufacturers, for business owners in Oklahoma. The, the PPE, uh, we, will, we will have some transparency around what we've ordered, what we have in our supply, and, and we'll get that out there. That's what we're gathering through this uh, uh, Governor Solutions Task Force. Uh, one company I want to uh, highlight, uh, Prairie Wolf Distillery, and right here in Guthrie, Oklahoma, uh, they switched their manufacturing, and now they have uh, manufactured the hand sanitizer, enough to put an eight-ounce bottle in every single Oklahoma's hands. That's the type of innovative innovation that we need uh, if the supply chain continues to be uh, disrupted in the future. And so uh, that's the mask that we're talking about. That's the, uh, uh, the protective gowns. And so uh, manufacturers, we, we will be letting everybody know what we need and, and kind of be transparent with our, with our needs on the PP &E, uh, or PPE, sorry, um, and, and, and let, let everybody know what we need. That's why we're setting up the donation facility that the National Guard is setting up at a couple different locations to get some uh, uh, donations. Can you talk about the state budget real quick, just the crisis and this rainy day fund going to be needed? That was from uh, Rick from Fox 23. So the, the, the state budget, uh, this year we're in fiscal year 2020 uh, through June 30th, and we it's possible we could have a what we call a revenue failure. Uh, we um, are working with the House and the Senate to how we would address that. The great news is last session we saved $200 million. We were very fiscally responsible with the taxpayers' dollars. Even though we had a budget surplus last year, everything looked rosy. Uh, we have the largest savings account in, in, in our state's history. Uh, that's significant, and it's going to help us get through this downtime. That's why it's so important to save in the good times. Uh, so we'll, we'll be able to use some of the rainy day or the stabilization fund to get us through 2020. And then as we're working on the budget for fiscal year 2021, uh, we'll continue to, uh, to do that as well. This sounds like a real premature question, but you mentioned one of your goals is to help the state economy rebound when this is over with. Have you given some thought to what that may look like or what you'd like to see the legislature do? I mean, what's that goal look like for you right now? Well, we're in the, we're in the uh, planning stages right now, so I have assigned out kind of six pillars. One of those pillars is what does it look like when we're in phase two, when we're past this, when we have this in the rearview mirror, how do we get Oklahoma's economy going? Uh, that's one of the pillars. The other pillar is how do businesses uh, innovate right now? And so those are some other recommendations that I have Secretary Copeland of the Commerce Department working on right now that I want to share with Oklahomans because we have some of the most innovative entrepreneurial minds. Uh, we have to continue to go to the grocery store. We have to continue to uh, go to church. And so do we do that online? And how do we do those things safely while we keep uh, business going and the employees there? Because if this is going to be a drawn-out process, uh, we've got to – uh, we, this may be the new normal for a while. And so that's my, that's my uh, um, uh, directive to Secretary Copeland to let businesses know, here's some ideas, here's some things. And then we want to hear from businesses as well. Uh, like restaurants, for example, they're doing the curbside and uh, uh, businesses are letting their employees work from home or they're, they're critical employees that have to be there. Uh, they're separating cubicles and they're practicing the social uh, you know, distancing that is going to mitigate uh, the spread of this in our state. So 
Um, th that's what I mean by those. We, we aren't ready to release those yet to Oklahoma, certainly not the phase two, uh, but, but we are working on it. That's what I wanted Oklahomans to know is those are my four main goals. But number one uh, is really just to protect the health and the lives of Oklahomans. So that's why uh, we're taking this seriously. That's why we're gathering this data to make sure that we're prepared uh, for whatever may hit our state. Do you ever see a statewide shutdown, Governor? This is from Ted Monty with Channel 6. Do you see a statewide shutdown like other states are doing, and, and when would that be needed? Again, right now, uh, the answer to that is, is, is absolutely not. Um, this is something we're looking at the CDC's guidelines. And I know that you're, we're hearing stuff that's happening in New York City uh, or in California or Chicago. We have a different set of facts here. Uh, that's why we're, we're getting prepared for what, uh, um, you know, when our, when our spike possibly could, could be. Uh, I'm not saying it couldn't happen sometime in, in the future, but right now, uh, that's not the decision of the state. That's not the recommendation of the federal government or the CDC to mitigate the spread uh, in the state of Oklahoma. There was a change this past week in uh, the state epidemiologist. There was a transition. Uh, can you discuss the impetus for, for changing uh, people in that role? Sure. Happy to. Um, yes, we had, uh, in fact, what we've done is we have flexed up uh, the State Department of Health. Uh, we're obviously in uncharted territory, unprecedented time um, of emergent response. And so we've actually flexed up the number of professionals, uh, particularly on the epidemi epidemiological team, which I won't try to say again. Um, we have flexed up the number of epis um, across the board. And so that includes those uh, who are working on immediate response and as well those who are working on uh, modeling. Um, and we have, among those things, we have we have pushed some folks who had previously been working in Oklahoma City out to our counties. It's, in, it's vitally important. You remember all 77 counties in Oklahoma. We operate through 66 discrete um, county health department locations, and they need to be touched as well. Um, those are going to be the places that a lot of Oklahomans come for service, uh, for testing, uh, and we have to make sure that they're getting messaged, they're getting serviced out of Oklahoma City. And so we've actually flexed up, uh, and a lot of folks are taking on uh, new roles, uh, both within our health department. Uh, and I would also say that across the state government, uh, folks are stepping up in truly extraordinary ways. And they are taking on roles they've never had to take on before. Their expertise permits it. We've never called it before. Uh, people are doing this while teleworking, uh, while working a lot of hours. And so I'm extraordinarily proud of the response of our state agencies across the board and how they've done. Uh, but I would highlight um, that EPI team uh, within our State Department of Health uh, who have really answered the call in the last days. Governor, you talk, you talk to President Trump about the supply chain nationally. Uh, they're saying grocery stores have been depleted. Do you want to say anything about what you've heard on that and tell them what they need to be buying and not buying? Well, yes. Uh, so President Trump uh, specifically told the governors in several different uh, calls that there will not be a disruption in the supply chain for uh, groceries. So the manufacturers will be in business the distribution chain, the big box stores. So there's no need for Oklahomans uh, to stockpile, um, you know, months worth of anything. And, and we've heard about toilet paper and the different stuff, uh, but that, dis that, that supply chain will not be disrupted from the federal level. That's straight from the president. So uh, you do not have to worry about that. We will not be closing grocery stores or from a national level, uh, President Trump will not disrupt that, uh, that supply chain. Last question right here, go ahead. Governor, I know you said that, you know, compared to some other states and cities, our numbers may not be quite as high. But just to reiterate, I mean, this sounds like this week testing is going to ramp up quite dramatically. Are you expect, I mean, so we're expecting to see quite an increase, I guess this is a question for the Secretary as well, quite an increase in the number of positives this week. I mean, is, is that your expectation this week based on the number of the increase in testing? Sure. Yes. The more the more we test, the more positive we're going to get, uh, and, and and we're tracking that closely, and, and and that's the reason we have the modeling in place. And uh, but sure, we're going to we're going to get more positive tests in our state. I mean, the, I mean, the modeling. I mean, any, you probably won't say a number, but I mean, you know, the ballpark of what you're expecting that you you know, at least reassure Oklahoma State. We, we know this number is going to be hit. This is where we're going to be. Um, we we are looking at modeling. Um, we we don't we don't have a, a specific target amount that you know we're expecting to come back. Um, you can look at at um, what we're we've currently tested to our positives, 
and we expect, you know, cases will increase. Um, you know, you can look at other states where over a period of um, six days, cases doubled or two days, cases doubled. We need to, you know, after we get a good pattern of testing, we get these 10,000 tests, we'll be able to see a little bit clearer how quickly we anticipate that our cases are, are increasing. Thank you, everybody.